My name is Dr. O'Donovan and in this video we're going to explore a really important topic, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, also known as ALL. We'll cover what ALL is, what causes it, the common symptoms, how it's diagnosed and treated, and what the outlook is like for someone with this condition. And just before we start, a really quick reminder, this video is for educational purposes only. It's not personal medical advice. So if you or someone you know have symptoms that we cover in this video or any other concerns, please always speak with your own healthcare provider. So what exactly is acute lymphoblastic leukemia? Well, ALL is a rare but fast growing cancer of the blood and bone marrow. Your bone marrow is the soft spongy tissue inside your bones where blood cells are made. ALL affects a specific type of white blood cell called a lymphocyte, which normally helps your body to fight infections. In ALL, the bone marrow starts producing lots of immature white cells called lymphoblasts. These cells never mature properly and don't function the way they should. Instead, they multiply quickly and take up lots of space in the bone marrow, crowding out the healthy red cells, white cells, and platelets. These are the types of blood cells that your body needs. Now this can lead to things like anemia, more frequent infections, and easy bruising or bleeding, and we'll cover these symptoms later on in this video. Now ALL can affect anyone, but it's most common in young children under the age of five and in adults over 50. So next, let's talk about the different types of ALL. Well, there are two main types. The first is B-cell ALL, which affects B lymphocytes. These are the cells that help to make antibodies to fight infections. Now, B-cell ALL is actually the most common form, making up about 75 to 80% of cases. Then there's T-cell ALL, which affects the T lymphocytes. These are the cells that destroy infected cells and support other parts of your immune system. Now, finally, there is a very rare type called a natural killer cell ALL, which affects another group of immune cells, but this is far less common. So let's talk about causes and risk factors in this section of the video. Now, you might be wondering what causes ALL. Well, ALL is caused by genetic mutations. These are changes in your DNA, and these affect how blood cells grow and develop. Now, these changes can happen before birth, during childhood, or even later in life. Often, we don't know exactly where they occur. They are, however, some known risk factors. These include things like exposure to radiation or harmful chemicals, certain viral infections like Epstein-Barr virus, and some inherited genetic conditions. People with Down syndrome, Fanconi anemia, ataxa telangiectasia, or leaf ramani syndrome are also known to have a higher risk of developing ALL. Your age, your sex, and even your family history can also play a role. So for instance, Boys over the age of one tend to have a slightly higher risk, and ALL is slightly more common in people who are white compared to people who are black. Smoking is another risk factor, particularly in adults. But just because you've got some of these risk factors or you've been exposed to them doesn't necessarily mean you'll definitely develop ALL. So now let's discuss some potential symptoms of ALL and specifically what you need to look out for. Because ALL develops quickly, symptoms can appear quite suddenly. The more common symptoms include feeling extremely tired or weak, looking paler than usual, easy bruising or bleeding for no clear reason. You might also get frequent infections or take longer to recover from common illnesses. A high temperature or fever is another key symptom. Other common signs can include swollen lymph nodes, often in the neck, the armpits or the groin, bone or joint pain, a loss of appetite or weight loss without trying to, and shortness of breath. Some people also notice a swollen or uncomfortable tummy, which may be due to an enlarged liver or spleen. Now, in addition to these more common symptoms, there are some less common symptoms. These include headaches, nausea or vomiting, blurred vision, and seizures or fits. Some people develop a cough or swelling and redness in the face, neck, arms, or hands. That redness might be harder to see in people with darker skin tones. You might also see swollen veins in the neck or chest area. Now, these symptoms can sometimes be mistaken for other conditions. So if any of the symptoms persist or worsen, especially for more than two weeks, it's important to seek medical advice. Now, I also want to mention that many of these symptoms are very common and not related to ALL at all. So please don't worry, but it is important that if they're not settling down or they're not getting better, you need to seek medical attention. 
Next, let's look at how ALL is diagnosed. Well, if your doctor suspects ALL, they'll start by doing a physical exam and asking about yours or your child's symptoms. Then they might order a complete blood count, CBC, also known here in the UK as a full blood count, to check the different levels of types of blood cells. Now, if those results suggest something's wrong, you'll likely be referred to a specialist, typically a haematologist, someone who specializes in the blood for further tests. These might include a bone marrow biopsy, where a small sample of bone marrow is taken and looked at under a microscope. Other tests might include a lumbar puncture, also known as a spinal tap, to check whether the cancer has spread to the central nervous system. And for this, a small needle is inserted into the back and a sample of CSF or cerebrospinal fluid is taken. Now, sometimes imaging tests like magnetic resonance imaging or MRI or CT scans may also be done to look for enlarged organs. Genetic tests such as flow cytometry, cytogenetic analysis and molecular assays, all complex tests, help doctors to classify the subtype of ALL and tailor the treatment accordingly. So now let's move on to treatment. Well, ALL treatment usually begins very soon after diagnosis and involves a combination of different types of therapies. And obviously the therapies are going to be tailored to that individual person. Now the goal is to achieve complete remission, meaning there are no signs of cancer in the body after treatment. Most people receive chemotherapy, which is given in phases over months or even years. First is a remission induction therapy, which aims to destroy as many cancer cells as possible. People often stay in hospital during this phase, which lasts about four to six weeks. After that comes central nervous system directed therapy, which helps prevent the leukemia from spreading to the brain or spinal fluid. Next is consolidation therapy, which works to eliminate any remaining cancer cells. Now this often involves being in and out of hospital for several months. Finally, there's maintenance therapy, which is done on an outpatient basis and can last up to two or three years to reduce the chance of relapse or the cancer coming back. Now, some people may also benefit from targeted therapy, particularly if they've got a genetic mutation called the Philadelphia chromosome. Drugs like tyrosine kinase inhibitors block specific signals that help leukemia cells grow. In some cases, immunotherapy or radiation therapy might be used, especially if the cancer comes back or hasn't responded well to treatment. And for those with high risk or relapsed ALL, so ALL that's come back, an allogenic stem cell transplant might be recommended. This involves replacing the damaged bone marrow with healthy cells from a donor. Now, I appreciate we've covered lots of potential treatment options here, but as ever, the treatment options are going to be tailored to you or your child, so always speak to your oncologist or specialist hematologist about the best options for you, and always try to ask what are the pros and cons, what are the risks that come with this, and try to get a good understanding of what might be happening. And remember, no question is too small to ask. So let's now talk about the prognosis or outlook. Well, ALL can be a really serious condition, but outcomes have improved dramatically, especially in children. So that's the good news that I want you to know. In fact, more than 90% of children under the age of 14 survive at least five years after diagnosis. Around 70% of teenagers aged 15 to 19 survive five years, and about 30% of adults over 20 are alive five years after diagnosis. Children who remain in remission for five years are often considered cured. Now, whilst long-term remission is less common in adults, newer treatments are helping more people to live longer. So now I think it's important that we talk about living with ALL in terms of what it's like to live with ALL. For many people, ALL becomes a long-term condition that needs ongoing care. Even after treatment ends, you'll need regular follow-up appointments to monitor for relapse or late effects. Living with ALL can be isolating because it is a relatively rare condition but joining support groups or survivorship programs can really help. These offer emotional support and guidance on everything from fear of relapse to living with fatigue and everything else in between. It's also important to live as healthily as possible, so quitting smoking, eating well, staying active, and taking care of your mental health all makes a huge difference. For children and teenagers, lifelong follow-up is often recommended. Pediatric cancer teams and child life specialists can provide really valuable support. I understand this can be a really emotional, complex, and difficult topic, so please do seek the mental health support that you might need, including speaking to a therapist. For more information on ALL, please check out the description box for links to trusted information 
and why not check out this video next. Thanks for watching and bye.